You're standing in the train station waiting for your normal commute home. The street lights begin to turn on as night falls. You read the LED illuminated train schedule and instinctively check your watch to see if the two match. You'll be late for dinner, unfortunately. But as that thought passes through your mind, the feeling of nostalgia envelops you as you look at your great-grandfather's watch. It reads, Undark, on it, and the numbers and hands glow in the quickly growing night. Passed down to you, from your great-grandfather, grandfather, father to you, this watch still ticks and still glows. You don't know who made the watch, the company behind the gears or the dial, who painted the numbers so perfectly. You just know that the watch was given to your great-grandfather in the military during the war, and its trusty old hands keep on ticking. And hey, it glows in the dark. But here's the thing about that old watch of yours. Those glowing numbers and hands that tick, 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 reassuringly, year after year, wind after wind. It was painted with radium, and will glow for over a thousand years. And the woman who painted the watch you wear probably died because of the radium poisoning, promised the paint she was using was safe, unknowingly killing herself dial after dial. Discovered by Marie Curie and her husband Pierre in 1898, radium quickly became a radical scientific advancement. Be it infused in water for a youthful glow, put into paint to glow in the dark, or used in early cancer treatments, even to this day, radium was the newest and fastest growing product used in the early 1900s. Radium was seen as the newest cure-all to any health issue or enhancement for beauty. Marie Curie pioneered research into radioactivity. As a physicist and chemist, it was her life's work to learn how radium worked, what it was, and how it could be used. She was the first female Nobel Prize winner and the first and only woman to win too. Her discovery of plutonium and radium through techniques she invented for isolating radioactive isotopes, science would be changed forever. Under her direction, the world's first studies were conducted into the treatment of tumors by the use of radioactive isotopes. What she did not know was what this radical element would soon become, how it would change the lives of thousands of people. The woman who discovered this amazing element we still use today would not know that big corporations like the United States Radium Corporation would willingly subject their workers to the poisoning toxicity that is radium. My name's Megan Brooks, and this is a walk through history. It's the 1920s. The world is celebrating the end of the First World War. Women dance to the Charleston. Men secretly make liquor under the new prohibition laws. Science is underway, making new advancements every day. Some good, some not so good. Walking around the streets of any given city, you hear the street salesmen, mostly conmen looking to score a buck or two, spouting, Radithor, the new you. Want to look youthful forever? Have a spoonful of this magical liquid and you'll have a glow unlike any woman around you. The crowds ooze and ahs, and a woman steps up to have a try. She, unknowing the effects, buys this product and will go home to ingest radium every day. Everywhere, you see posters that scream out that radium is the new way to stand out, and stand out you will. Hair products, makeup products, nail polishes, clothes, you name it. All infused with this unfathomable thing called radium. It glows in the dark. You'll be the one to sparkle the most at your next party, advertisements cry. Radium. It's what made America for the longest time. And so were the women who painstakingly, literally, manufactured these goods. Primarily clocks and watches that were needed not only for your everyday life at home, but our strong military men bravely defending our country every day. All the while, women paint the watch dials for two cents each, their nimble fingers the reason they were hired, and the fact that because they were women, they could be paid less. What you see here is the same old poor work environments known in the 20s. There were no unions. There were no laws that regulated and protected work hours and the employees. 
Years passed before anyone really started noticing the horrid effects radium would have. I mean, Marie Curie knew that radium was poisonous, and if not handled properly, could kill you. A few of her workers, her husband, and herself were getting ill from radium poisoning. And as several other products, including radium, were released to the public, like hair products, clothes infused with radium, or even toothpaste, regular citizens were falling ill. Unfortunately, the stone Madame Curie threw into the water by discovering radium had a ripple effect she had no control over. But a few key people who knew the dangers, who knew the issues, who kept it secret that the paint the women used to make the watch your great-grandfather relied on in the war was killing them. These dial painters who were falling ill and making their way into the news would quickly become known as the Radium Girls. Running from Waterbury, Connecticut, Orange, New Jersey, and Ottawa, Illinois, hundreds of women worked long hours for watch companies. But for these women, who would eventually find themselves deteriorating from radium, were excited about the prospect of working with this new exciting material. With no understanding of how dangerous the product was, they were so enthralled by the glow that they painted their nails, their faces, and clothes at work before going to parties. No one had told these women that doing so would advance their deterioration. Here's a little history for you. The United States Radium Corporation was established in 1917 and ran until 1926, and the Radium Dial Company was established in Ottawa, Illinois in 1922. The USRC was originally called Radium Luminous Material Corporation. They engaged in extracting and purifying radium from uranium ores like uranite to produce luminous paints from mines in Colorado and Utah. Because Colorado had an abundance of another uranium-containing ore called carnotite, most of the radium used in the dial painting came from Colorado and Utah uranium mines. The paint used by the Radium Dial Company under the direction of the USRC would call their paint Undark for their ability to glow nonstop. Radium Dial used Ottawa's old high school as their first factory. The purpose of these factories from Illinois, Connecticut, and New Jersey, between Radium Dial and the USRC, were to paint dials for clocks. Their biggest client was West Clocks Corporation in Peru, Illinois, being that they provided watches to the US military. The biggest production took place at the USRC's biggest factory in Orange, New Jersey, and became the turning point for the dial painters. As this new and exciting element was being used in almost everything, women were getting sick. Their teeth would get sore and fall out. Pieces of their jaw would break off and crumble, leaving these dial painters unable to eat. Hospitals wrapped their heads and jaws in bandages, keeping their jaws held together, or used screws. They would get headaches, fatigue, and infertility issues. And as time went on, more workers fell ill with the same symptoms. But the paint is safe! The women who painted these dials at each factory were encouraged to lip dip, creating a finer point to their paintbrushes for better looking results on the dials. As the women would dip paintbrushes in the paint, make the fine point with their lips, teeth, or tongue, and paint the fine numbers they were hired to paint, more women were getting sick. But the companies were urging that the paint was safe. One employer going so far as to eat a small spoonful of the paint in front of the line workers. These women were all misled by the USRC. What the dial painters didn't know was that while the USRC hired women to handle radium and perform other tasks at their dial painting factories, their owners and chemists would be behind lead screens, wearing masks, gloves, and using tongs in the radium paint making process. But by the time it became paint, it was safe, right? That's what these women were led to believe. Until women started getting sick and seeking out doctors. Too many women started seeking out doctors. So the USRC distributed literature to several medical communities about injurious effects of radium. Paying these doctors off, telling them, be they surgeons, dentists, or simple general care practitioners, that if women from the dial painting companies came in with complaints, to examine them. 
Year after year, women would fall ill. Some would suddenly not show up to work, only later to be found dead. Having gone to see doctors, the same doctors, for the same ailments, these women would be examined and diagnosed with syphilis, as the STD had similar symptoms and would not only keep the company safe, but tarnish the woman's name and reputation. Countless women would be told they had syphilis, instead of the doctors who were paid off telling the women what was really happening. Though the women were becoming suspicious, as again, only their friends who were dial painters were suffering and dying, many women still lip-dipped their way into death. You're probably thinking, how can this be happening? How can there be no legal representation for these women who are clearly being affected? Well, before unions were created, there was the Consumers League, the beginning sparks of what would become unions for workers in hard jobs. Formed in 1899, they fought to end child labor, fought to create a safe work environment and minimum pay and decent work hours for women. The 1920s did not have worker protection. Again, there were no unions. OSHA had not been invented yet to provide laboratory or worker safety measures. It wasn't until 1970 that Congress officially passed the Occupational Safety and Health Act and established the Occupational Health and Safety Administration. There were no laws governing businesses to give out information to their employees about dangers in their work, unless prompted by the government officials. It just didn't exist. And when it first started to come into play, big companies did everything in their power to cover it up. So investigating the USRC was complicated. Too many women were too scared to give up their much needed jobs. Two cents a dial and the average dial painter painted maybe 200 wasn't enough of an income and they couldn't lose their jobs. It was left to the few who had nothing left to lose to stand up to the USRC and the radium dial company. Dial painter after dial painter had been reporting the same illnesses and ailments and all being told the same thing. So five women in the New Jersey factory challenged their company with the Consumers League over workers' rights and protection. They sued for occupational diseases and occupational injuries, but the suits had a statute of limitations of two years. Through the five women in New Jersey, the countless deaths of other dial painters across the country the Consumers League chairman Catherine Wiley and journalist Walter Lippmann, the Radium Girls case began. In Catherine Wiley's investigations, it was discovered that USRC's chief chemist, Dr. Edwin Lemon, was developing similar symptoms as the dial painters. He was soon too ill to go to work and eventually died. His cause of death? Radium poisoning. His death and that of the countless dial painters in all three USRC's radium dial factories led to investigations into radiation poisoning by the Consumers League. During the investigations, the defense contractor hired by the USRC conducted a ruse with an x-ray machine, the same x-ray machine used on the affected dial painters as a way to mislead the public and spread misinformation. If these x-rays show no damage from radium, done by the doctors hired by the USRC, then obviously there's no issue with the work the dial painters were doing. Wiley later found out that this defense contractor for the USRC was actually the largest investor in the radium mines in Colorado and Utah, supplying the military with their watches. The USRC and other watch dial companies rejected the claims that radium was dangerous, as they did not want to lose their companies to these litigations. Doctors in surrounding areas of each factory were paid off. Paid off to keep their files locked away and out of sight, and to lie to the women who were falling apart. Imagine what these women must have gone through, oblivious to why their bodies were literally falling apart, unknowingly being poisoned, by the paint they were promised was safe. Countless doctors giving different diagnoses or even lies, leaving these workers to go home or work and suffer till they were too ill to work, too ill to live. After World War I in another USRC factory, 
The Waterbury Clock Company in Connecticut had boomed in demand for watches. They hired women at low wages to work seven days a week, offering women the opportunity to get out of the home to earn a wage and to be a working lady. This was huge in the 1920s, as they were also fighting for the right to vote. The idea of being out of the house, having a job, and working with this new wondrous product of radium, these women were so excited to be working as dial painters. Even though women were paid much less than men, dial painting quickly became a woman's place in the workforce, and for what it's worth, they were paid more as a dial painter than if they were to be a laundress or a maid. So women in the Waterbury Clock Company were still excitedly working away while word had gotten out around the country about what was going down in New Jersey. But again, the women in Connecticut were being treated and told the same thing. Lip dipping is not dangerous. Continue working or your pay will be docked or you'll be fired for insubordination. These women didn't want to lose their fun new jobs over drama that was being caused in New Jersey until one of their own died until 30 of their own died. Frances Spletstotcher was the first to die in the Waterbury Clock Company. She was in her early 20s. Before she died, she suffered from anemia, sore throat, deterioration of the jaw, soft teeth, spontaneous bone fractures, and aches. She wasn't the only woman to have such afflictions. But again, syphilis has many of the same symptoms. Although the Waterbury Clock Company officials were beginning to understand the effects of radium on their own workers, they rejected Spletstotcher's death in connection to radium, but discouraged lip dipping after 1925. Four years later, 22-year-old Mildred Cardo died, and the following year after that, Mary Demulis in her 20s died as well, believed to be from continuation of lip dipping. After these deaths, the company forcefully denounced lip dipping in their factory. After 1926, it became evident that the Waterbury Clock Company caused illness and death to their workers. Between 1926 and 1936, the company issued over $90,000 in medical settlements. But, like any slimy company trying to save their skin, after the last of the settlements, the company changed its qualifications for workers' comp and in 1927, a woman now only had three years to file a claim rather than the normally given five. Typically, symptoms of radium poisoning didn't show up till closer to five years of work, when they developed cancer or other symptoms, too late to file a claim under the new workers' comp qualifications. In 1941, the Waterbury Clock Company decided to address some of the employees' concerns and in work with the union, agreed to increase their wages by two cents. Last radium girl from Waterbury, May Keen. She died at the age of 107 in March of 2014. She credited her long life to laziness and a relocation of jobs at the clock company. She had worked as a dial painter for only a few months, but still lost all her teeth by the time she was 30 and faced many bouts of cancer. Jumping back over to New Jersey, the Radium Girl's story was blasting away, reaching not only other states, but other countries. Finally reaching over to France, Marie Curie was reading paper after paper of what was happening. And because of her knowledge and creation of what Radium was and could do, Curie received some backlash of her own, taunted and harassed in the streets as a killer because people's lives were being taken by this Radium she found. But the New Jersey Radium Girls case got huge because it was covered by the media, especially by journalist Walter Lippmann. He was a crusading journalist and former muckraker who edited a powerful New York newspaper at the time when New York papers were the most influential. As the papers were flying off the shelves about what the New Jersey dial painters were experiencing, other factories in Connecticut and Illinois were facing the same issues women dying of bone deterioration, fatigue, anemia, and more. Both states lost 30 to 40 women due to lip dipping. A little truth needs to be cleared up before we discuss the court cases and their findings. Many adaptations over the years of the Radium Girls 
depict the women rising up and fighting the companies all at once, each state having their own dramatic fight against the USRC, defying their owners and quitting their jobs, one woman being the prime pusher of the movement to protect her fellow dial painters, that it all happened at once. But that's not true. The litigations and lawsuits didn't start until several deaths had happened. It took two years for the primary women who fought the USRC to even find a lawyer willing to represent them in court. No one wanted to take on one of the biggest corporations. Until the Consumers League was able to gather enough evidence to even have a case against the USRC and their US radium dial company. The lawsuits were only brought up because one previous worker for the USRC had gone to a doctor unaffiliated with the USRC and said, I'm suffering from these pains and my teeth are suddenly falling out. These deaths and complaints may have been happening at the same time over the years at the different factories, but it wasn't until Grace Fryer, a previous dial painter for New Jersey's factory, one of the lucky women who eventually found a said doctor who was not paid off, asked her where she used to work. And that's when it all got started. This is where the clarification needs to happen, as many representations show Grace, or a fictional woman who basically represents what Grace was, as a current dial painter, learning of the injustice and fighting the big fight. But in reality, Grace had quit her job as a dial painter two years before she started showing any symptoms of radium poisoning. She wasn't making enough money, and she really wasn't good at painting. Grace didn't have nimble fingers and kept arguing to use water or cloth to clean her brush, but was discouraged from doing so as it took too much time. So she lip-dipped her way through her job. But soon she left to become a bank teller. Two years into her job as a bank teller, though, Grace's teeth started to fall out of her jaw and abscessed. She had gone to doctors over the years complaining about aches and pains, bad teeth, and fatigue. And you guessed it, she was shoved off and diagnosed with some other ailment not aligned with radium. Until her teeth started falling out. When her jaw pains worsened and her teeth literally fell out of her jaw, she went to a doctor she hadn't seen before who asked what her previous occupation was and explained that her ailments were probably because she was a dial painter and radium effects don't show up for close to five years in most painters. Grace's x-rays showed serious signs of bone decay. Her jaw looked like a honeycomb and her spine just the same. This led Grace to question and investigate her old job. She found out that the first doctor who examined her and his fellow assistant was referred to her by a friend, a fellow dial painter, who had also seen them as well. But this doctor was found to actually be Frederick Flynn, a Columbia University specialist hired by the USRC for the examinations of the dial painters. When girls would complain of pains or illnesses, their bosses would send them to a highly recommended doctor. Flynn was not a licensed medical practitioner. He was an industrial toxicologist on contract with Grace's former employer, and the fellow doctor who examined her with Flynn was vice president of USRC. Grace made it known what happened to her when she spoke to the Consumers League five years after she had stopped working at the company. But the League had already had a case against the USRC and was building it with four other dial painters, Edna Hussman, Catherine Schaub, and sisters Quinta McDonald and Albina Larice. It was then that these five women brought their litigations to court and were dubbed the Radium Girls. These five women, who were brave enough to sue the United States Radium Corporation in all different stages of radium poisoning decay. During one court session, Grace explained that one evening when she blew her nose, her tissue glowed. Another woman described that when she was holding her baby, her knee suddenly gave out and was broken. She hasn't walked the same since. Another dial painter described that one night she was looking in the mirror and pushed on her jaw because it ached, and a piece of it fell into her hand. A doctor after that was able to simply lift the rest of her lower jaw out, leaving the poor woman with just a stump and bandaged. Description after description of bone loss, teeth falling out, and glowing tissues made it into the papers, 
showing other dial painters around the country that they were not alone. In these litigations, the Consumers League chairman, Catherine Wiley, contracted Alice Hamilton, Harvard University Authority on Workers' Health Issues. Hamilton was on the League's national board, and she was already investigating the USRC for several years for several different reasons. A colleague at Harvard was also used, Cecil Drinker, who studied work conditions at USRC factories and reported them back to Wiley. Together, Drinker, Hamilton, and Wiley were able to find that the heavily contaminated workforce, unusual blood conditions in everyone, and advanced radium necrosis had been going on for several years, largely in part at the biggest factory in New Jersey. Drinker had also noted that the USRC's head chemist, Edward Lehman, just like the creator of the radium paint, Dr. Sabin A. Sochuki, had serious lesions on his hands and similar health conditions as his dial painters. The paint was a mixture of crystalline phosphorescent zinc sulfide with an addition of radium, a half-life of 1,600 years, mesothorium, a half-life of 5.8 years, and radiothorium, a half-life of 1.9 years, into the form of insoluble sulfates. Both chemist Edward Lehman and the creator of the paint would die within four years due to radium poisoning. These men and the rest of the other dial painters aided in the Radium Girl's cause. But, as Drinker became familiar with the utter lack of realization of the damages inherent in the material being manufactured by all of those in authority positions by the USRC, Drinker, Wiley, and Hamilton put together a report and demanded better protection for the workers. But it fell on deaf ears. Arthur Roeder, who is president of USRC, resisted the suggestions and continued to tell the women at the factory in New Jersey that they were safe. What women he had left actually, as most had started to quit, stopped coming to work as they were too ill, or were dead. Drinker asked Roeder to pass along his files on worker complaints and doctor visits, and he told her that he would pass along his findings from his people, but of course Roeder never did. Roeder then went on to refuse the Harvard publishings of Drinker's findings, stating Drinker had promised confidentiality in the reports, delaying them, pushing them out, and aside by putting in his own findings into the scientific journals. Railroaded, Drinker carried on with her work and observations. But in April of 1925, Alice Hamilton wrote to Drinker regarding the USRC investigations. Mr. Roeder is not giving you a square deal, Hamilton stated. I had heard before that he tells everyone he is absolutely safe because he has a report from you exonerating him from any possible responsibility in the illnesses of the girls. But now it looks as if he's gone still further. The New Jersey Department of Labor has a copy of your report and it shows that every girl is in perfect condition. Do you suppose Roeder could do such a thing as to issue a forged report in your name? Drinker finally realized why Roeder had been stalling and railroading her. To keep her real report from being published, and put his forged report in the journal instead. Drinker sent Roeder's original report to the Department of Labor to publish it in the scientific journal, despite the USRC's threats. But again, the report never made it. But a year later, during the litigations, Drinker was able to testify and stated, Dust samples collected in the workroom from various locations from chairs not used by the workers were luminous in the dark room. Their hair, faces, hands, arms, necks, their dresses, their underclothes, even their corsets of the dial painters were luminous. One of the girls showed luminous spots on her legs and thighs. The back of another was luminous almost to the waist. But in other parts of the factory, like the laboratories where the chemists worked, had lead screens and proper safety measures, showing the USRC did understand and comprehend the dangers of radium. If they could protect the chemists from the radium, they could protect the dial painters. But like so many factory workers in that time, the radium girls were expendable. After all was said and done, and the court cases were finished, 
These five women in different stages of radium poisoning, some too ill to even lift their hand to testify, were fighting not just for their lives and other dial painters, but for establishing legal precedents for governmental regulations and labor safety standards. The three USRC factories, Illinois, Connecticut, and New Jersey, alongside Radium Dial Company, fought the Radium Girls, and it took eight attempts before Radium Dial was forced to pay for all damages. $10,000 to each woman and a weekly pay of $12. This was the first time in American history where workers' safety issues were actually brought to the forefront and won forcing a company to acknowledge and pay for all medical bills current and after till the women's death. Which, for most, wasn't any longer than two months. Some women didn't live long enough to see their settlement check. News of the women's damages had reached all the way to France, where Marie Curie was living. Even though she had been following their cases, she was still learning the effects of radium herself. When she saw what was happening to the dial painters in the three USRC factories, she stated she had never seen anything like this, not even in wartime when countless factories were dealing with radium. They used small sticks with cotton wadding rather than paintbrushes. She also passed along information saying for the women who were not as gravely affected that they could eat raw liver to treat the anemia. But as for the five women in New Jersey and the countless other dying workers, Curie explained, I would be only too happy to give any aid that I could. However, there is absolutely no means of destroying the substance once it enters the human body. She was no doctor and could not venture whether the women in New Jersey would die. But from what the newspapers were showing, Curie stated, I think it imperative to change the method of using radium. Curie herself would die of radium poisoning only a few years later, in 1934. About a decade after the tragedy of these women's death, the Atomic Bomb Commission stepped in and said, if it hadn't been for these dial painters, thousands of workers might have been and might still be in great danger. Especially important to say, as in World War II, radium was used a lot and in more than just bombs. Ottawa, Illinois, now known as Radium City, tore down the radium dial building in 1968 with no regard to potential radioactive danger, resulting in radioactive debris left all over the town. By 1984, Illinois approved $2.5 million to tear down the Luminous Process Building, by which time 40 women formerly employed by the plant had been linked to radium poisoning deaths. Within two years, over 6.5 million had been spent decontaminating the site there are still hotspots that can be spotted by the absence of snow settling on them during winter. Modernly, the Radium Girls' experiences are a reminder that we need to listen to whistleblowers, as they themselves can inspire us to fight against injustices and attempts to silence truth no matter what it takes. Glowing like the numbers on your great-grandfather's watch, these women will forever glow. Not just their bones, but their memories and the lessons their experiences taught us. Not every new advancement is for the better. And lastly, it is said that if you go to one of the Radium Girls' graves in New Jersey, Illinois, or Connecticut, and hold a Geiger counter over their grave, the counter will still tick. <laughs>